So let me welcome our next speaker. Dr. Edward Delcor is the president and director of the Department of Defense and Educational and Apologetic Ministry. He is mentor at Greenwich School of Theology and serves as vice president of Grace Bible University. Dr. Delcor holds a Master of Apologetic from Columbia Evangelical Seminary and a PhD in Theology from Northwest University. He is a published author of several apologetic and theological books. Let's welcome. All righty. So you will be speaking for 45 minutes and I'll put a reminder up at five minutes. And then um, for everyone in the chat, I do want to say no disrespectful discussions about anyone talking about anyone. I'm reading the chat and it's it's looking kind of a little hostile. So let's be respectful of everyone and each other's beliefs. We can get our point across without being rude or anything like that. So with that being said, you are all set and um, we'll see you back here. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, interesting. Um, when, when we do these kind of, uh, these kind of conferences, I always think of, I always want to congratulate pastors who are not doing their job and not teaching the differences between Christianity and Roman Catholicism, especially the difference between their view of justification and our view of justification, which is the only recognized gospel. And that's why we're here today. And that's why there's conferences around the world against the heretical view of Rome, because people are dying with Bibles in their hands who are embracing the Roman Catholic doctrine, which is heretical because they deny, again, the only recognized gospel, which is justification through faith alone. So I think conferences like this are very important, and that it should be that we draw a line of demarcation between genuine biblical Christianity, biblical Christianity, and I'll say now, I'll say this now, and I'll say it probably later, patristics are not a valid hermeneutic to interpret the Bible. Without patristics, most Catholics, particularly apologists, would be silent. You would hear crickets coming out of their voice because exegesis is just not something they like to engage in. Uh, it's not that they don't have the ability, a lot, some do, but they are bound and devoted to Rome. So there is no need for exegesis. Rome has did the job and there is no higher authority than Rome. So groups like Roman Catholicism and other false religions who nay the sacred name of Christ, but mock and deny the only recognized gospel, Jesus, and justification through faith alone. Among most, and I want to bring out this point as I get into my particular topic, the impotent Christ of Rome, which you'll, I'll be focusing on that, but I'm going to run through some of the reasons why the Roman Catholic Church is a false church. Now, we've heard evangelicals speak of the two, at least present the two questions regarding the Roman Catholic Church. Are they a true church? With significant air, meaning are they really Christians? They just they just air on some really goofy things, um, or are they a false church with significant truths? So that group would say they're definitely a false church. They're not Christian, and if they die, they'll die without Christ. The ones who embrace Roman Catholic doctrine, however, they do um, have significant truths. They do believe in the deity of Christ, the Nicene definition of, of God, uh, the Trinity, the resurrection, the incarnation, um, and all the essentials, those essentials. But they deny justification through faith alone. So it doesn't matter how articulate they are on the definition, on the Nicene definition of God and the doctrine of the Trinity. If you deny Christ and his work, you simply don't have Christ. Paul made this point clear. You can't separate or bifurcate the person and nature from his work. So those are the two options. However, I'm theologically dissatisfied with both of those options or propositions because based on a de the defective Christology and the perpetual idolatry of Rome, especially as we heard uh, Matt Slick, especially on the idolatrous doctrines of, of Mary, uh, according to the written word of God, which alone is thaapanustas, God breathed out alone, 
fully equipping the man of God for every good work, scripture alone. Biblically, the Roman Catholic Church, as I see it theologically, is a false church with no significant truths. Again, you can say that Jesus is God, I believe in the Trinity, I believe in the Ascension, I believe in the uh, physical resurrection, but if you deny his propitiatory work on the cross as the very ground of justification, you simply deny him. You cannot separate the person from the work that he does and the effectualness of that work as Rome does. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, the apostle says, Christ became our righteous. Not true in Rome, our righteousness. Not true in Rome. Because you have doctrines like Sadis uh, uh, Passio, which is purgatory, and the Marian doctrines, which show that to be false. He becomes a way to righteousness. He does not become our righteousness that has been imputed to our account. Okay, so let's get right down to it. I find four reasons. Now, there's many more reasons. But for significant reasons, and the last reason is actually the topic I want to discuss, the impotent, impotent Christ or the weak Christ of Rome. Four reasons that exclude Roman Catholicism from being a true Christian church. When I talk about Roman Catholics, I'm not talking about every single individual. Um, who knows? You know, you would have to analyze every single in individual to see about their belief system. And I'm, I, I suppose it's possible that you can have extraordinarily ignorant people sitting in the sitting in Catholic churches having no idea what Rome actually teaches. Um, I think it's unlikely, but it's certainly possible. So when I talk about Roman Catholicism, I want to talk about the official doctrines and some of the main and plain heresies of Rome, and which will lead up to my main topic, the impotent Christ of Rome. Four reasons I have that exclude Roman Catholicism from being a true Christian church devoted to the Christ of biblical revelation and showing that Roman theology is not consistent with biblical theology on main and plain fundamental issues. Reason number one, Rome is a false church with no significant truth because she practices biblically defined idolatry ascribing divine attributes to the female creature Mary assuming that everyone's hearing her prayers, that would ascribe to her not only omniscience, but some kind of omnipresence in terms of her hearing the prayers of millions simultaneously. A female creature having this omniscient attribute, which only God has. Besides that, there's no biblical evidence for people praying to Mary. In fact, I would say the apostles were horrible Catholics because after Acts 1.14, you don't hear about Mary. Mary's never mentioned. They were horrible Catholics. They never mentioned her. They never called her the queen of heaven. They never saw her of intercessor, co mediatrix. Nothing. They said nothing about Mary. Nothing after Acts 1.14. Aside from Galatians 4.4, which is a reference of the virgin birth, Nobody talks about Mary. Nobody prays to her. In fact, lexically, prayer in the first century, uh, in the biblical text, prayer is to God alone. There's no evidence of people praying to creatures. Teaching that humans, this is a primary reason why they are a false church with no significant truth. Rome teaches that humans should give Mary religious service. Hyperdulia, they call it. Dulia is from a Greek term, dulea, or dulea, which literally means a, a service. Now, it's not wrong to serve people, but in a religious um, uh, context here, dulia or dulea in a religious context is the same thing as worship. And it was roundly condemned in Exodus 20, verse 5. Don't serve anyone else but God. Don't worship him. Don't serve them. This is religious service. Dulea, in a religious context, is prohibited by God. Paul roundly condemns this Roman practice in Galatians 4.8. He said, to the speaking of the pre-converted Galatians, he says, when you were a pagan or when you didn't know God, you were a pagan. And I'll, I'll paraphrase based on the verb here. You were given dulia. 
he uses uh, from the verb duluo, which is where we get the the Greek noun dulea from the Latin dulia. He says, you were given dulia to those by which fuse, by nature, are not being gods. Not being gods by nature. That's what you're doing. Paul says, when you were a pagan, you gave dulia to creatures. That's exactly what Rome does to Mary. Hyperdulia. And they give dulia to other saints. That is idolatry. Giving something that's reserved for God alone. Again, we're looking at religious service. Exodus 25 and Galatians 4, 8. Don't do it. Reason number two. Rome is a false church with absolutely no significant truths because they have a defective Jesus. No truths can come out of that. They don't believe in the same trinity I believe in because Jesus became my righteousness and died for my sins, and I'm justified through faith alone. That's a different Christ. Therefore, all the doctrines that flow out of Christology and theology would be false. Reason number two, Rome is a false church with no significant truth because of their horrible doctrine of transubstantiation, or I call domerism, because it deforms and thus rejects the biblical view of the incarnation of Christ. How does it do that? It asserts that Christ's sarcos, or his body, his flesh, was ubiquitous and not truly man. Because truly man is not ubiquitous. It's not spread out all over the world. In other words, when um, at the Eucharist, when they take the elements, the priest has the power to ontologically change the elements, ontologically change the elements to the literal flesh and blood of Christ, literally. Now, if they said metaphorically, okay, or if they said figuratively, or symbolistically, like many of the early church fathers, they used the, the, the term symbol. Okay, that's not heretical. But they used the term, this transubstantiation, they used the term, Thomas Aquinas coined it as ontological change. It was an ontological change. It literally changed to his flesh and blood. That means when the Roman Catholic out here is taking the communion, partaken of the elements that transubstantiated, and someone's doing it across the world, they're both eating his literal body parts and his soul <clears throat> and his deity, according to the catechism of the church. It's all of it literally changed. They're eating his body. They're eating his flesh, literally, in an ontological way. That means it wasn't a true flesh. It wasn't a true flesh. It was something different. It was ontologically different than truly man. Therefore, they reject the incarnation by rejecting that the incarnation, his humanity, was truly humanity because true humanity is not ubiquitous. It's not all over the place. In the Catechisms of the Catholic Church, paragraph 14, 13, under the consecrated species of bread and wine, Christ himself, living and glorious, again, 14, 13 of the Catechism, is present in a true, real, or physical way and in a substantial manner, his body, his blood, his soul, his divinity. So you're eating his body, blood, soul, and divinity, but people are doing this simultaneously. They're eating the body and blood simultaneously, and they're chomping on his soul. Simultaneously, that's not perfect man. They reject the incarnation. However, the New Testament presents the incarnation as the Son becoming truly man, not some kind of ubiquitous hypersarcos whose actual flesh and blood, soul, and divinity can be eaten like a spicy tuna roll simultaneously by millions. Some in, in total opposition to Rome's definition of the incar of the transubstantiation, which is a deformation and rejection of the perfect unity of the Son. The Apostle John in John 1 14 says, And the word sarx agenita became flesh. When he used the word sarx, he's not referring to an X man or some kind of un human person that can have his flesh spread out and his blood all over the place, all around the world simultaneously. Same with Romans 9, 5. Katasarka is the phrase Paul used, according to the flesh. In Romans 8, 3, 
God did set by sending his own son in the likeness of what? Sarkos. No, first century dictionary defines sarkos as a omnipresent or a ubiquitous flesh as an offering for sin. So if you reject the incarnation, you're rejecting the offering of sin by truly man. His sarkos was not divine. His flesh is not divine, nor is it ubiquitous. That's a distorted man. His flesh was perfect. He became truly man, not X-man that's ubiquitous. In fact, when we look at the, the doctrine of the Trinity, we refer to three distinct, co-equal, co-eternal, coexistent, divine persons. The Trinity does not consist of his flesh, and certainly his flesh does not consist of you, some kind of ubiquity. In 2 Timothy 2.8, Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, ra uh, res raised from the dead, risen from the dead, ek spermatos, from the sperm of David. It doesn't get more true than that in terms of his humanity. Rome rejects that Christ was truly man, because truly man, according to Paul's gospel, he said in 2 Timothy 2.8, according to his gospel, he was a descendant of David, and David wasn't ubiquitous. Christ is not ubiquitous, not in the apostles' minds. The biblical incarnation, Jesus Christ became truly man. And in Philippians 2, Chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, notice the Arius verbs here. Genomenos, having been made in the likeness of anthropon, having been made in the likeness of man, or of men. Men are not ubiquitous. Paul says he was made in the likeness of men, anthropon. And having been found, two Arius indicative verbs there, having been found in the appearance of anthropos. The nominative use, a man, twice. Paul says the incarnation consists of Christ having been made and having been found in the appearance of a true human, not ubiquitous human. The New Testament does not teach anywhere that the created sarcos of the Son was divine, ubiquitous. That's utter heresy. He was truly man. Number three. Number three. Rome is a false church with this many significant truths, no significant truths, because, also because, I should say, she re uh, rejects the only recognized gospel, justification through faith, charis ergon, apart or without works. I didn't write it. So Paul said, as we'll see again, Romans 4, 6, how is a man declared righteous? Well, Paul says, Referring to David, a man under the law, he says, God imputes righteousness, choris ergon, apart from works. Not true in Rome. They'd reject that because you're not declared righteous in Rome. You're made righteous, and it's through works. Paul says, apart from works. She rejects justification as permanent, objective. Remember, Rome doesn't have an idea of objective justification. It's subjective. It has to do with, as they point out in Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1989, paragraph 1989, it has to do with the interior man. Okay, that's not the biblical view. That's not, that's a subjective righteousness. Why do you think Roman Catholics lose their salvation all the time, or they go to purgatory, or they die without Christ? Because the justification is anything but permanent. They deny that it's permanent an objective declaratory act of God pronouncing, not making, a sinner just. And worse, Rome rejects that justification is monergistic, an act of God alone. In the sixth session of Trent, Canons Concerning Justification, we read in Canon 9, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, and you know the rest, let him be anathema. By one stripe of the pen, they condemned every single Protestant. If you say you're justified by faith alone, you're cursed of God. You know, I wouldn't have a problem with Rome so much if Galatians, Romans, Ephesians weren't in the New Testament, but they are. In chapter 7 of Decree 
concerning justification. Trent's, Trent's document again, chapter 7. For faith, unless hope and charity are added, oh, are added. Did you get that? It's faith and added things. The Roman system is a series of ands, Jesus and Mary, faith and works, scripture and tradition. We can go on and on. Unless works, which they define as hope and charity here, are added thereto, neither unites one perfectly with Christ, nor makes a living member of the body. It's, you know, again, I, I look at these things and I always recall John chapter 8, verse 47. Only ones who belong to God will hear the words of God. For the same exegesis that affirms the deity of Christ affirms justification through faith alone apart from works. Rome's definition of justification is subjective. And it's not eternal. It's not, it's not permanent. Here's what we read, and I'll read the more full in this quote of Catechisms with Catholic Church, 1989. Justification is not only the remission of sin, but also the sanctification. Notice how they merge those two doctrines. The sanctification and, hear this, the renewal of the interior man. So it's inward. That's why when you sin, you chip away at it as a Roman Catholic. They have no assurance at all, as we'll see. They theologically confuse justification with um, hagiosmos, sanctification. Now, Rome's view, as we're getting ready to come to the main point, our last point, number four, but Rome's view of justification, this is very important, starts with the view that the atoning crosswork of God the Son was not sufficient in and of itself. It wasn't sufficient alone. You, had to add, you have to add things. It's a whole add-on system. Protestant doctrine is a doctrine of, of ones, the one sacrifice, the one Lord, the one mediator. Contra Roman Catholicism is a system of ets, which is the Latin for ands. They believe the cross work was not sufficient in and of itself alone to be the sole objective ground of justification. And look, all of us here, all, all the speakers here, we pray for Roman Catholics. We pray... I pray for Roman Catholic. I have a lot of Roman Catholic friends, even families. TD Ch prays for We all pray for the Roman Catholics, that God would remove them from the darkness of Rome because they reject the only means of salvation, Christ alone. In clear biblical refutation to their view of justification, their horribly defective heretical view, we have to understand, and here's, here's the basis of it, Here's the basis. Here's the first premise. The reason why they see justification and why they, as they do, and why they hold to a very unbiblical view of justification is because Rome's disdain and theological in incorrectness regarding justification and the preservation of the believer, the, these views, their great disdain for it, for justification through faith alone and the preservation of the believer, revolves, listen, around the old Latin term, justificare, which means to make just. That drove Luther crazy until he started studying the Greek text. The first century documents were written in Greek, not Slavonic, not Latin, not Aramaic, but the first, the earliest manuscripts. Uh, of the New Testament documents were written in Greek. And the Greek noun does not treat the verb dikaiao to declare, pronounce, just or righteous, like the Latin term, use of vicare. Luther had to hear this. It drove him crazy because how can he be made the righteousness of God? It wasn't until he studied Greek and the exegesis of Romans chapter 1 16 and 17, when he understood it does not, the Greek word does not comport, the inspired word does not comport with the Latin, uh, eusificare, to make just. The Greek verb, dikaiao, and the noun, 
For example, in chapter Romans chapter 3, 4, 5, 1, chapter 9, or ch um, verse 9 of chapter 5, and all the rest, where we have that Greek, Greek term, as Bauer, Gringrich, Donkeranot, Bidag defines it, one of the most standard lexicons, to be pronounced and treated as righteous and therefore become dikaios. Liddell and Scott, to deem right. None of these, none of these lexicographers are seeing what Rome sees. That's not the lexical definition. That's the Latin definition. Thayer, to declare, pronounce, one to be just and righteous. And as Leon Morris points out, and other grammarians have pointed out, again, doctrine is only substantiated by the exegesis of the text. It's not that Roman apologists cannot exegete, but they're bound and devoted to the higher authority, higher than their own exegetical skill, their high authority, the Roman church, and whatever they deem as a valid interpretation and teaching. There is no higher authority that exists. Verbs, as Morris points out, verbs that end with omicron and omega. There, there are two O's in Greek. One's a short, one's a long, right? Like dikaio, right? The term to declare just or righteous. And referring to moral qualities have a declarative sense. They do not mean to make. And he points out that the usage is never for the transformation of the accused. It always refers to a declaration of his innocence. Now, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. Anyone could go to the New Testament text and check out these things. In fact, without Greek, these doctrines are simple dimple because it's one of the fundamental issues of the gospel. If you reject justification through faith alone, you're rejecting the only recognized gospel. Justification is objective, not subjective, not emotional, not psychological. You don't feel things. You don't feel a burning in the bosom when you're justified. It's objective and monergistic. Romans 1.5. Now, we don't have lots of time. Time is our mortal enemy. But I just want to go through a few verses, then I'll go to the last point. Romans 5.1. Therefore, he says the conjunction is used to point out what he just said in chapter 4. Keep in mind, Romans, FYI, is Paul's thesis, which is simply this. God's method of justification has not changed. And in chapter 4, he gives Abraham... As his example, who was not under the law, he gives David as an example, his church, to us. Justification, the method of justification, God's method does not change. It's through faith alone, apart from works. Romans 5.1, <clears throat> having been justified, right? Having been justified, all those three words, it comes from one Greek term. It's the same verb. That I mentioned before to declare just, but it's an areas passive participle. Why is that significant? It's passive. It's passive. What is a passive voice? It's when the action is being done. And here to the man, I didn't do it. He justified me. It's monergistic. I know part of it. I don't believe in purgatory. It's heretical. I don't help God justify myself. Not according to the text, it's monergistic. Dikaiothentis, passive, 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 participle. Having been justified from faith, literally, ek, from pistuos, from faith. That means, syntactically, faith is the instrumental precondition, not the cause. From faith... Peace, arene, peace. This is permanent peace. It's not a ceasefire. Permanent peace. Echomen. We have. 
yes, we're all aware of the textual variant there. And I, you know, sometimes novice will, novice apologists or Roman apologists will try to make an issue with Ekumen. The fact of the matter is, Romans 5.1, I can spend a lot of time on the variant here. Is it Ekomen or is Ekamen? Subjective versus indicative. Here's an indicative. Most translations would translate the indicative. We have, as a certain certainty of truth, we have this peace because we have been justified from faith. We have peace. Not the gladness of the heart, but reconciliation. Why is it indicative? We, we you know, there, there's good evidence for both. But Romans 5, Paul is not exhorting. He's giving statement and facts. Indicatives are all over the place. So contextually, that's why most grammarians would see the variant as indicative. We have peace. Prastan tha'an with the God intimately through the Lord Jesus Christ. God's work of, mon of justification, God's work is monarchy. It's, it, it's his work alone. We don't justify ourselves. And faith is the instrumental precondition, not the cause. Nor does faith or belief, same word, precede God's monergistic work of regeneration. That's what he does first. Many verses express this exegetically, that regeneration precedes faith. God makes a sinner alive in order that he will believe, and faith is a gift. John 1.13, 1 John um, 5.1, Acts 13.48. I mean, there's so many passages. And the cause, since faith is not the cause, it's the preconditional uh, precondition of justification or instrumental precondition, the instrument. The cause being the vicarious cross work of Christ, the sole ground of justification. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 4. I know I went to 5 first because I want to show you the passiveness of justification, that we receive the action, and it's of God alone, and faith is the instrumental precondition. Romans 4, verses 4 through 8. Again, Paul's thesis in Romans, God's method of justification has not changed. It's through faith alone. Not by works of law, not by any works. Again, the word works, like in Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 2, 8, 8 and 9, Ergon, it's, it's where we get the word energy. Anything you do is a work. Anything you do is a work. You can be sleeping and you're, you're exhausting ergon, energy. Anything you do, you'd have to be dead not to do works. And Paul says we are not saved by any energy that we do. So nobody will boast. Romans 4, verses 4 through 8. Um, I'll go slow <clears throat> on this. I'll, re I'll read it literally. Um, the one working, the term work here, the verb, is used in a present participle form, dative, right? So the one working, so that literally reads the post positive here. The one working, his mythos, his wage, is not legisitai, credited or imputed, credited, According to Kareen, grace. You work, you get a paycheck. That's not grace. You worked for it. That's Paul's point to Roman Christians who were working. Many people in Rome were working. They would have understood this concept. To the one working, his wage is not credited according to grace. Kareen, uh, um, according to grace. But Adversative conjunction, not that, not grace, but according, according to what is due. According to what is due. That's when you work, you get a paycheck, you don't get on your knees and thank your boss. You worked for it. It's not grace. You worked for it. In verse five, this first phrase, the only difference is there's a particle, a negative particle to the one not working. So in verse four, you have this group, the one working. Then in verse five, you have the one, the one not working, same participles use, the one not working, but has faith, but has faith. Listen to this, his faith 
is counted or reckoned as righteousness. Now I can say that. The Bible says I'm justified without working. Now, yes, works should follow if you're a true Christian. We're not saying you don't work after you're saved. But Paul's point here is the one not working has faith, but has faith. His faith, says Paul, is counted or reckoned as righteousness. If you're a Roman Catholic, you're going to have you're going to have some trouble dealing with this. You might have to revert. Well, that's speaking of the law. Well, the law wasn't mentioned until verse 13, I think. This is talking about any work. That's the context. And it's not law because he just exampled Abraham. He wasn't under the law. His faith is counted as righteous, righteousness. The one who does not work. The one who does not work. The one who does not work. That's what Paul said. I didn't write this. Then in verse 6, and notice this, in verse 6 of chapter 4, just as David, again, he's pointing to an Old Testament personality, the psalmist, David. Everyone knows David. Old Testament. Paul says in verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom, I want every single Roman Catholic listening, perhaps, to hear this. Blessing on the man to whom Ha Thaos, the God, Legisatai, imputes or credits righteousness, choris ergon, apart from works. Blessing on the man, that's me, that's all Christians, to whom the Lord credits righteousness, choris ergon, apart or without works. Choris, without works without Mary, without sacraments, without work. That's what he said. In verse 8, which 7 and 8, Paul, again, Paul, Paul's quoting Psalm 31 in the Septuagint, 32 in Hebrew, 31 verses 1 and 2 from the Septuagint. In your Hebrew Bible, it will, it will be uh, Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Look at verse 8. Blessed is the man who sinned the Lord... <clears throat> We, we have this construction here that eliminates, that refutes Catholic doctrine on this. That's a creaturely work system. Autosatiric. A self-working salvation. Blessed is the man. That's me. That's you if you're a Christian. Blessed is the man who sinned the Lord. Ume. That's a double negative there. Never, never, followed by a subjunctive various, a, a mood of possibility, legis etai. Never, never, not even a possibility, shall impute. The Lord will never, never, not even a possibility, will the Lord impute, impute against him. That's good news. That's good news for me. It's bad news for a Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic cannot say they're the blessed man in Romans. Four, eight, because the Lord will impute or credit sin against him. Not me, not Paul, not the Christian church. A Roman Catholic could not say he's the man in verse 5 of chapter 4, faith without working is credited as righteousness. They can't say that. Nor can he say he's the man who God imputes righteousness apart from works. He's not that blessed man. 1 Corinthians 1.30, it's his doing that we're in Christ Jesus. It's not my doing. I didn't tell him to elect me before I was born. It's not my doing. It says it's his doing, that's what Paul said, it's his doing that you, the Christian church, are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom of God. And, and listen, he became righteousness. Not Mary, not sacraments, not charity, not any works. He became righteous, which comports to Romans 4, which is consistent with Romans 5 in the entirety of the Old and New Testament. He became my righteousness, sanctification and redemption. That's a whole lot of stuff. He alone, solus Christos, Christ alone. And then Paul says, so no one will misunderstand. So it is written, let he who boasts, boast in the Lord. 
That's from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9, 24, because it's his doing. Further, further from Rome, justification is presented in the Bible as monergistic, not a cooperation of man's um, free will libertarianism, his mighty works, his lustful devotion to Mary. It's not a cooperation. It's monergistic. It's not a cooperation with the beggar Jesus who cries on the cross, hoping you'll believe in him, begging you'll believe in him. It's not a cooperation. That's not what scripture teaches. We already saw that it, it's monergistic, like in Romans 5 1 and also in 4. But notice, I, don't, I just want to take a few minutes to laser light the monergism of justification. In Romans um, 8 29 30, we have something historically called. The Ordo Salutis in Latin, the order of salvation, but I like the golden chain of salvation because it denotes five verbs that God does alone. Man is not included. Man is not hanging on the cross. He wasn't there for the first few verbs. He wasn't there. There's five verbs in the golden chain of salvation. It's called a golden chain because each of these areas of verbs, past tense, each of these verbs are inextricably connected by the demonstrative and relative, listen, accusative pronoun, showing that man is the object receiving the action of the verbs. And it shows that God's work in our salvation is alone. He did it alone, totally opposing the Roman creaturely system of salvation, God and man. Verse 28, for those, relative pronoun in the accusative, he foreknew, prognosco, it's only used three times. And God is always the, the subject, man is always the, receive, the receiver, receiving the action. For those he foreloved or foreknew, he also pro arizo, predetermined or predestined. In verse 30, those whom, accusative here, those whom he predestined, these, demonstrative, but it's still in the accusative, tutus, the pronoun, these he also called, this is the inward call that results in justification, he also called, and whom, whose, again, the accusative pronoun, look, look at the series of pronouns connecting these verbs, he called these, he justified, he justified, God justified, whom, accusative again, pronoun, then he justified, these he glorified. Justification is monergistic. Denying God's work in justification. It's the only recognized gospel. Justification <clears throat> through faith alone is denying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Four, here's our last point. Last point here. <clears throat> Rome is a false church. Last point. This is the main point, but it won't take long. Rome is a false church with no significant truth because of her view, her view of a false Christ, an impotent Christ, whose sacrificial atoning crosswork was undefinitive. It didn't definitively save anybody because Jesus is just wanting, he's wooing people. And his work is perpetual. If you go to the Roman Mass, you see it's perpetual. They keep sacrificing Christ. His work is never finished. It's not a telestai in a real sense because all Jesus does is make, make a way you got to do the, the heavy lifting. Jesus, you know, he's weeping and he really wants you to come. He makes a way. The atonement in Rome only makes a way. It's never finished, especially seen in Rome's doctrine of sadis passio or purgatory. Sadis passio is a word that means suffering of the souls to purge the evil because the work of Christ was not sufficient. What does purgatory say? says the work of Christ was not sufficient because you have to go down and get scrubbed up. So as seen in 
purgatory and transubstantiation. In Catechisms of the, of the Church, 1366, Romans, Roman Catholics officially sees the Eucharist as, quote, quote, a sacrifice because it represents, represents the sacrifice on the cross. And this is the worst thing I've, of all the statements coming out of Rome defining the Eucharist. They say it's propitiatory, meaning it was a propitiation. In 1367 of the same document, Catechisms of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1367, listen. The sacrifice of the Christ, of Christ, and the sacrifice of the Eucharist. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. It doesn't get more dishonoring to the Lord's work than that. Then it says the sacrifice, the cross and the Eucharist, is truly propitiatory. Seriously? Do Roman apologists understand what the term hilasmas or the verb actually means, the lexical semantic of propitiation that we find in a couple of few places, uh, particularly in 1 John 2 2? Do they are they aware of the lexical semantic of hilasmas? Forgiving sins and removing the wrath. So the Roman Catholic Eucharist is a sacrifice that removes the wrath and forgives sins. No, the Bible says Jesus' sacrifice did. That's it. Against Rome, the New Testament teaches that the atoning work of Christ, of the Thaos Christos, the God Christ, was completed once and for all in his hilasmas, and it was definite and sufficient, which purgatory denies that, it was sufficient to remove the wrath, to remove all the sins, taking them away permanently without the help of his mother. His mother didn't help him. Rome th thinks his mother helped him. His mother's mentioned so much in the atoning work of Christ, as I'll show. You would think Jesus is Italian. He can't do anything without his mother. Permanently, his cross work took away the wrath, removed it, took away the sins permanently without the help of his mother and without the help of unrecognized Roman priests and without the help of Christianly works. I say unrecognized Roman priests because there's only two, aside from the priesthood of the believer, there's only two recognized priesthoods. Two, Levitical and Melchizedek. Now, Roman priests don't claim they're Levitical priests. I know that. But they can't be Melchizedek, hold a Melchizedek priesthood because Hebrews 7.24 says that was untransferable. A rabbitas, un, no successors. I always use that with Mormons. So what, what priesthood are they? It has to be a biblically unrecognized priesthood. Jesus' cross work was out the help of creatures. And in contradiction to the Roman, the Roman Jesus, in 1 John 2, 1 and verse 2, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, John says, My little ch children, I'm writing you in order that you may not sin. If anyone sins, paracleton, ekamen, that same indicative verb as in Romans 5, 1. No, there's no variant here. Paracleton, when anyone sins, we uh, literally, we have one who is called to be alongside of us. We have one who is called to be alongside of us. Proston patera, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Notice Mary's not in that text. And verse 2, and kai altas, and he, he lasmas, propitiation is, note that verb, he is the propitiation, not he will be. It's not a hypothetical event here. He is. This is a present tense. Esteem. He is. Now, Roman Catholic can't say that because they will experience God's wrath if they lose their salvation. They will experience pu uh, punishment for their sins. They've got to be purged of all the evils in purgatory. They have no assurance. They don't know if they're going to make it. But my Christ of biblical revelation is esteem the propitiation for my sins. 
unlike the Levitical priesthood, which is ineffectual, we see that in Romans, and unlike the unrecognized priest of Rome, Hebrews teaches, these are my last two points, Hebrews teaches that the sacrificial cross work of the Son of Man alone was a fat pax. Once and for all, he uses this term several times to show the cross work of Christ was effectual once and for all time. 727, regarding his alone sacrifice, we read, he himself, at Alton, this is reflexive, meaning by and for himself, meaning alone, he did it, offered himself a, a fat packs once and for all, for all time. In 9.12 of Hebrews, through his own blood, he entered the holy place, a fat packs once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Well, if you're a Roman Catholic, you don't, you don't, you have no assurance of eternal redemption. You may lose it. I have that insurance because the author of Hebrews tells me, as does the author of Romans. In Hebrews 10, 10 through 14, by this will, we have been set apart or sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, Hephaphax. The next verse said, every priest stands day after day ministering the same old offering that can never take away sin, that can never take away sin. But he, Christ, having offered one sacrifice for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. The fact he sat down means his work was finished. Not in Rome, not according to the Eucharist. His work is never finished. In verse 14, by one offering, he has perfected. That's a perfect indicative, by the way. He has perfected a completed action with continuous results. Roman Catholic can't say that. It's a perfect indicative there. He has perfected for all time those being sanctified. It's an active participle there. Against Rome, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, particularly 6, Jesus Christ is the one mesites, the one mediator, not Mary. Jesus Christ is the one, one mediator between God and man. Now that's a good news for me. It's bad news for uh, for Catholics because they deny that he is not the only mediator. In fact, we know in the scripture, Jesus doesn't share his mediatorial role with his mother. Mary is not the mediatrix of our salvation. Now that quote came from a doctor of the church, Alphonsus Liguori. Now he, keep in mind, there was only, th historically, there was only 37 doctors in the Roman Catholic church. I think Irenaeus was the last one to just, I mean, recently to be declared as a doctor, but Alphonsus was a doctor. And he states this, that the matrix of our, that Mary is the uh, mediatrix of our salvation in the massive book that is a standard in Roman theology, The Glories of Mary, page 69. He was a canonized saint and declared a doctor of the church. Most Catholics are not doctors of the church to disagree with him. I don't know anyone who's refuting him. On page, the same work, Glories of Mary on page um, 191 and 92, Liguori taught, we have access to Jesus Christ only through Mary. Do you believe that? That's what he said. And he was declared a doctor by the Pope, by Pope Pius IX. We have access to Jesus Christ only through Mary? And he says, the Lord decreed that all men should be saved by the intercession of Mary. Where did the Lord decree that? Sounds like a charismatic, just hearing voices. The Lord never decreed that. He decreed the opposite. They brutalized Mary. It's a false Mary and a false Christ. Unlike the ineffectual Jesus of Rome, who's not able to save believers, eternally preserving in them to glorification, where his mediatorial work never fails, they think it fails because day after day, a believer forfeits his justification or his salvation because of unconfessed sins or lack of performance or he didn't do enough work, or he committed moral sins, he never got confessed. He, he's always forfeiting. He, his mediatorial role fails in Roman Catholicism. And in fact, as Logori points out, maybe he neglected the service of Mary. Because Logori points out, if you neglect the service of Mary, you'll die in your sins. 
in page 256 of the glories of Mary. You'll die in your sins if you neglect the service of Mary. I would assert the opposite. You'll die in your sins if you do the service of Mary according to Rome. In sharp contrast to the Jesus of biblical revelation, in sharp contrast, we have the Jesus of biblical revelation who said in John 5.24, truly I say unto you, truly, truly, he that is hearing, present participle, my word, and believing the one having sent me, has a chi, present indicative, eternal life, does not come into judgment, but has passed out of, per, another perfect indicative, metaba bacon, has passed out of, completed action, that's me, that's you as a Christian, has passed out of the, the death into life. Just a note here, the verb has, has eternal life if you're believing. Syntactically, they're, they're simultaneous actions. When you have a present tense verb and two present tense participles, they denote a simultaneous action. So I, I have eternal life. I'm not waiting to see what's going to happen. I'm not waiting to see if I commit an unconfessed mortal. I don't have to. Jesus said, no, you have it, believing and hearing. The last verse, one of the last verses I want to give is, in contrast to Rome, is John 6, 37 through 39. And uh, I just want to go through these. It's important because we're looking at the words of the biblical Christ, not the impotent Christ of Rome, who can't save alone, who can't save infallibly, who can't save eternally. Jesus said, all that the Father, all that the Father gives, gives, present act, uh, um, active here, gives, indicative, active, present tense, all that the Father gives will, heck say, will come. That's a future indicative. That means it's a presentation of truth. All that the every single person that the Father gives with the Son, Jesus says, this is a future indicative, a sure thing. They will come to me. They will come to me. And the one coming, ergomenon, participle there, the one coming to me, never, never, ume ekbalo exo, never, never, not even a possibility. It's that same construction found in about 85 times in the New Testament. Strongest way to negate a future possibility. Never, never, not even a possibility will I cast them out. That's good news for me, bad news for Rome. In 38, verse 38, I've come down to heaven not to do my own will, but do the will of him having sent me. By the way, that's a great Trinitarian passage against Unitarians and oneness doctrine who sees Jesus as the Father. It's verse 38. He differentiates his will and the Father's will. Two persons. In verse 39 of chapter 6, now Jesus defines the will of the Father. And this is the will of him who sent me in order that everyone he has given, now we have a perfect tense, pass, ha, all the ones, everyone he has given me. Perfect tense, indicative, singular. That means a past completed action. If you were given, the time you were given, it's solidified. Everyone that he has given me, listen to this, verse 39, I lose nothing, but raise Alta, it, up the last day. He promises that Rome is wrong. He promises that Rome has a defective Christology because Jesus says, I don't lose anybody. Roman Catholics do. They lose people all the time. Unconfessed sin, mortal sins, no neg neg neglecting the service of Mary. What a scary way to live. It's an unbiblical way. Jesus says the reason why you don't believe in John chapter 10, verse 26, the reason why you don't believe, because you're not my sheep. No, he didn't say the converse to that. He didn't say the reason why you're not my sheep, because you believe. People become a sheep because of the Lord's sovereignty. Only sheep believe. Verse 27 of chapter 10 of John, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me and I give them eternal life. And here we go again with this construction that's used in salvation contexts all over the place. I give them eternal life and never, never, epilontai, shall they perish. 
Then we have this added phrase that's not in our translation. It's used about 23 times. Ace ton Iona. Never, never. Here's how the whole phrase lit, uh, reads. I give them eternal life. Where are the sheep? Because we believe Christ. And we've been regenerated. As a result, we're his sheep and we believe. I give them eternal life and they never, never, not even a possibility shall perish into the age. Ace ton Iona, into the age. That's not a Greek, that's not a variant reading. Does it get more guaranteed than that? Well, for me, it does. I mean, this is the guarantee that I see. It doesn't get more than this. Never, never, not a possibility. Yeah, but you don't know the sins I committed. And, you know, un never, never, not a possibility. Paul said the same thing in chapter 4, verse 8. Never, never, not a possibility will the Lord impute a sin against you in the context of justification. Romans 6, God credits righteousness apart, apart from works that can't be ignored. And in conclusion, very interesting. I want to go on and on, but I know time is our mortal enemy, keeps creeping up on us. If you ever notice Paul's so theological bookends in Romans chapter 8, verses 1, verse 39, speaking of the same thing that Jesus spoke about, never, never, not a possibility will they perish into the age, guaranteed. We have bookends in Romans 8, verse 1 and 39. In verse 1, there is now, the adverb noon is used, there's right now, this is for Christians, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for me because I'm in Christ Jesus. I don't have an impotent Christ. That's not what I believe. I don't believe Mary is the mediatrix of my salvation. There's no condemnation for all those who are in Jesus Christ. And then the book end, in verse 39, nothing is able to separate us. Nothing is able, that includes your sin, is able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. The Old and New Testament teach that forgiveness of sins is through Christ alone. Acts 10, 36, and 43. Peter says, you know the message that Yahweh, that God sent to the people of Israel, proclaiming good news of peace through Christ Jesus. That was the message in the Old Testament? According to Peter, it was through Christ Jesus, not through Mary, not through any other means, through Christ Jesus. And verse 43 of chapter 10, the same speaker about him, Christ, all the prophets, not just the major ones, not just some minor ones. If you believe inherent scripture and that you believe Peter's words in writing is infallible, Peter said about him, all the prophets testify, everyone now believing in him. It's a common phrase in the gospel of John. Everyone believing in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's for us. It's not for Roman Catholics. You see why we have to evangelize Roman Catholics due to their auto-satiric system, due to their view that Christ, his mediatorial role, fails every time someone loses their salvation, and he did not have a vicarious propitiatory work. They don't believe that because he keeps failing. Lastly, as we already went through the golden chain of salvation, Paul rightfully asks in verse 33, after he gets through these five verbs, in verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Now in Rome, there's a lot of things that can bring a charge against God's people, according to Rome. Unconfessed sin, neglect of Mary, not confessing more. I mean, I can go down the list, but Paul says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Monergistic here. God is the one who justifies. In verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? The Pope can't separate you. The church can't separate you. Paul already gave a list of five verbs, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. In light of that, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Well, tribulation, trouble, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, a sword. Then in verse 38, I'm convinced that neither life or death, angels, nor principalities, nor things in the present, nor things to come, nor powers, height or death, or any other created thing 
in verse 39, has the ability, including your own sin, he mentions a bunch of any other thing in cre in creation will be able <coughs> to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I think I'll close there. And um, that's it. Thank you. So I um, have an announcement. So I got good news and bad news. The bad news is, is that our guest speaker that was, uh, his position was the Roman uh, Catholic, Dr. Nick Kihas. Um, I guess he's not feeling well, so we won't be able to have the panel discussion. But the good news is we can bring all the speakers back on and you guys from the chat can ask questions. Um, go ahead. I know why he's not feeling good because I heard Matt Slick, Anthony Rogers, Tony Costa, and myself speak definitively about Rome. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't feel good either if I was a Roman Catholic. <laughs>